Hey guys, Tyler Ansman here with Tyler Ansman Performance. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is velocity development, what the purpose of a velocity development session is, should be self-explanatory, um, and some of the comments on social media about ball or great way to blow your arm out. All right. So if you've been on social media recently and you've seen anybody throwing you know, above 85 miles an hour and it's not a strike or it happens to be a running throw or some kind of constraint drill where you're just throwing into a net or a wall, um, the comments are pretty ridiculous and people don't seem to really understand the purpose of a velocity development session. They seem to think that everything should just be a bullpen and that guys should just be dotting fastballs, curveballs, and sliders um, every time they come into the gym. And that's not really how it works. We're going to talk about why today. We're going to talk about what these specific adaptations are like. And we're going to talk about how to design um, a proper velocity development session. And then I'll be pointing anybody in this direction um, when they comment on my future videos. All right, so let's get into it. So there are two broad categories of adaptations um, that both take place uh, when we properly utilize a velocity development session and that need to take place in order to increase throwing velocity. Okay, so one of those is neurological adaptations, the other one is physiological adaptations. So we can think about these kind of in, in uh, using other examples. So uh, the neurological adaptations would be akin to becoming like a better race car driver, right? Whereas the physiological adaptations would be akin to improving the horsepower of the car, okay? So we need both in order to maximize our throwing velocity. And let's get into some specifics in terms of what those look like. All right, so the first neurological adaptation that we're gonna to discuss today is coordination. So you can think about this in terms of kind of muscle force being applied um, at the right time, in the right direction, in the right sequence, right? You can obviously see how this plays an important role um, in throwing velocity, right? And so we know from research, um, when we're talking about velocity specific adaptations in weightlifting, um, that, you know, this is the said principle, that people respond to the specific type of training that they're given, right? So when they split guys into two groups and they have one lift relatively lighter weights fast, and they have one lift heavier groups, you know, by necessity slower, right? What they see are the adaptations are specific to what they did. So the guys who lifted the light weights fast got better at high velocity stuff. Whereas the guys who lifted the heavier weights, they got better at the kind of uh, max strength type of, type of thing, but they really didn't improve their velocity um, side of the spectrum as much, right? We can see the same thing when we're talking about throwing. This is kind of why the guys who focus on, you know, throwing, you know, super low effort strikes um, don't continue to gain throwing velocity after the point of puberty when kind of physical maturation can just kind of give them velocity on their own. Um, so what we need to see is specific training in order to kind of improve this aspect of coordination. So the second neurological adaptation that we're going to talk about is motor unit recruitment. All right, so motor units can basically be divided into kind of low threshold and high threshold motor units. So what we're looking at are kind of uh, the motor neuron, right? And then the group of muscle fibers that it innervates when we talk about this. So low threshold motor units are comprised mainly of type one muscle fibers or slow twitch, all right? And so what happens is these are very resistant to fatigue, but they're not capable of kind of these big outputs, all right? But they are recruited first due to the size principle, okay? Then we have high threshold motor units, which are primarily type two muscle fibers, all right? They're not as, res as resistant to fatigue, but they are much more capable of high outputs, okay? And so what we see is we get better recruitment um, from these when we are lifting very heavy weights, when we are lifting light weights in close proximity to failure, or when maximal velocity is intended, all right? So we know that repeated exposures to kind of maximal efforts can make more of these high threshold motor units available, hence, we need to expose ourselves to high velocity throwing somewhat frequently, okay? So we'll talk about what that frequency looks like later on, but just know that this is important in order to kind of get this adaptation that we're talking about with um, motor unit recruitment. So the third neurological adaptation that we're gonna talk about is rate coding. And so what rate coding is, is basically um, the frequency of uh, the discharge of action potentials from the motor unit. And so basically what's happening is how, is how quickly is it kind of sending these signals for the muscle to activate, all right? Because the faster these things are occurring, the greater potential we have for these kind of high velocity movements, right? And we also know from research that exposure to high velocity stimuli has a greater impact on uh, improving rate coding than does heavy loading, right? So hence, this exposure to high velocity throwing, these high velocity movements that go along with this are very important when we're trying to maximize throwing velocity. All right, uh, so the last kind of neurological adaptation that we're gonna talk about is the activation level 
of antagonists. All right, so we can think about kind of antagonistic muscles as the ones that oppose the movement that you're trying to create. So when we do a bicep curl, right, the triceps is the antagonist in that case. They're, it's opposing elbow flexion, okay? So <clears throat> antagonist activation is important when we talk about kind of joint stability, but too much, too high a level of activation of the antagonist is going to um, reduce the level of net torque that the agonist can produce kind of at that joint. All right, and so we know from research that high velocity movements have been shown to reduce the level of antagonistic activation. So it's important that we kind of include this in our training as well to kind of minimize the level of activation we're going to get um, from the antagonists. Okay, so now on to the physiological adaptations. So kind of like we talked about in the beginning, right? The neurological adaptations are for the software, right? The physiological, physiological adaptations are for the hardware, right? The best hardware in the world isn't going to matter if your software sucks and vice versa. You need appropriate hardware to be able to kind of enjoy all of those features from the software. So the first physiological adaptation we're going to talk about is fascicle length. So high velocity movements have been shown to increase muscle fascicle length. So if we think about fascicles are uh, basically um, sarcomeres in series. So sarcomere is kind of the smallest functional unit of a muscle and the more we have of these in series the longer kind of fascicle length we have. Okay so if we think about it this way, this is why it kind of matters. So we, we have a, a faster muscle shortening velocity with longer fascicle length. And the reason is all of these sarcomeres are shortening at the same time. Okay, so if we have 10 sarcomeres in series, right, shortening at, you know, 2 meters per second versus 5 sarcomeres in series shortening at 2 meters per second, we have increased that velocity just purely by the fact of increasing that length because they're all happening at the same time. Okay, so we know from research that the fastest 100 meter sprinters in the world have been shown to have longer fascicle length than their slower counterparts. All right, so the same can kind of be applied to throwing. Um, our assumption can be that the same is probably true um, relative to the uh, important muscles in the arms of throwers, um, if we kind of think about it that way. And we also need to apply the principles that sprinters train by if we're going to make that cognitive leap. So what do they do a lot of, right? They sprint fast pretty frequently. They do a fair number of kind of ballistic and plyometric movements, and they also uh, lift some pretty heavy weights. So we need to apply those same things to throwers. We need these high-velocity stimuli, whether it's kind of in the throwing session or if it's from that kind of plyometric or ballistic type movement, and we probably need some element of that maximal strength stuff. So this is why we have to kind of play all of this into our uh, kind of training plans, but especially why the high-velocity throwing stimulus is very important. So the next important kind of physiological adaptation that we're going to talk about is fiber type shifts. Okay, so um, fiber types are probably something that pretty much everybody's familiar with. So we have two broad categories, right? Fast twitch, slow twitch. Um, fast twitch is type two, slow twitch is type one. All right, but beyond that, we can get kind of a little bit more specific. So within the, the fast twitch category, we have type 2A and type 2X. So type 2A are your pretty fast fibers, and then type 2X are your super fast fibers. Okay, and so we know from research that uh, the fastest sprinters in the world tend to have more type 2X fibers than their slower counterparts, right? So this is kind of an important distinction. And we also know that fiber type, shift, fiber type shifts can occur from both type 2A to 2X and 2X to 2A, all right? And what this really depends on is the velocity that's present in the program and the level of fatigue that's present, okay? So the greater fatigue we have, the more likely we are to get a shift from 2X to 2A. And the higher velocity we have with the lower fatigue, the more likely we are to get a shift from 2A to 2X, or at least maintain our level of type 2X fibers, which we absolutely want to do, okay? So again, just one more reason why we need this exposure to these high velocity stimuli that we're kind of talking about, like a velocity development session, all right? Because we really want to make sure we get, we maximize our type 2X fibers and minimize our negative shifts with that level of fatigue and kind of like sub-maximal effort, uh, moderate intensity, high fatigue type of training. Okay, so our third piece to the physiological adaptations is um, increased connective tissue stiffness, all right? So a muscle-focused approach kind of has its limitations, right? And a lot of training programs tend to be very muscle-focused, which there needs to be some kind of focus on that, but connective tissue is also an incredibly important piece, all right? So when we think about kind of concentric muscle action, so shortening muscle actions, um, what's kind of happening is as the velocity increases, the force decreases. Okay, so this is kind of a limitation. So if we get to very, very fast velocities, how much are muscles even able to shorten to help with that? The answer is not very much and maybe not at all. There is a point where they're no longer really going to be able to assist very much because the movement velocity is just too high. So what are we relying on then? Well, that's where connective tissue comes into play. So tendons and fascia and this kind of thing tend to kind of be seen as 
you know, maybe secondary, but really they're movement amplifiers, okay? So when we think about what we're doing with our approach, we need to have some aspect of a focus on improving uh, tendon and connective tissue quality. So likely this means improving the stiffness of these, okay? So if we think about a very compliant tendon, for example, what's happening is it doesn't take a lot of effort to kind of stretch it, okay? So don't apply very much force, you can stretch it fairly easily. You're going to have to go really, really far to kind of find its end range, and you're not going to get a, a huge return from that, okay? Whereas a stiffer tendon is going to take a lot more force to pull it back, and you're going to get a very big return from that, okay? So there is this kind of happy medium of, of compliance and stiffness that is beyond the scope of this video, but in general, we're going to need to improve the stiffness qualities of this connective tissue in order to kind of maximize our throwing velocity. And so we know from research, again, kind of going back to the sprints example, that the fastest 100 meter guys tend to have stiffer Achilles tendons than their slower counterparts, okay? So the same can kind of be seen in uh, the overhead throwing athletes and uh, kind of when we look at the shoulder complex, all right? Tend to be a little bit stiffer, all right, in a lot of guys, or if they're very compliant, they're going through these very, very deep ranges of motion in order to kind of find where they can get that stiffness. Either way, it's an important kind of quality to consider, all right? And so what we see is with high velocity movements, not only are we improving the stiffness of the system, but that stiffness is also helping improve kind of our high velocity output. So they kind of go hand in hand the entire time. So this is just another reason that we need to include this high velocity throwing in our program if we wanna um, kind of take care of that connective tissue stiffness that we really need to improve in order to kind of maximize throwing velocity. So the final physiological adaptation that we're gonna talk about is muscle pination angle. And so what this is, is basically it's the angle um, of the fibers relative to the longitudinal axis of the entire muscle, okay? And so what, what's important to know about this is that when the, um, when the pination angle is, is greater, what we see is uh, the muscles are able to produce more force, but the shortening velocity is slower. And the reason for this is because we have fewer sarcomeres in series, um, they're in parallel. And so what's happening is because this shortening velocity is slower, a greater number of cross bridges can form, producing higher forces, okay? And the opposite is true, right? When we see um, the, the decreased angle of pination, we tend to see higher velocities of shortening, okay? And so when we, we kind of uh, expose athletes to higher velocity training, we tend to change this muscle pination angle to be uh, less and, and closer to parallel, okay? And so what's also important to consider with this is that how these will differ for proximal versus distal muscles, all right? So we think about proximal to distal sequencing, which is basically any movement that uses the kinetic chain involves this, all right? So just the bigger, more proximal stuff first transfers energy to the smaller, um, more distal stuff, and the velocities are higher as you get away from the center of mass, okay? So generally, the more proximal muscles are going to have greater pination angles because the demands are different, right? They need higher force, it's going to be slower shortening velocities, which is fine. And then as we get further and further away, they're exposed to higher velocities and the demands are for higher velocity, the pination angle is going to be less, all right? So this is kind of important to consider. And again, as we're exposing athletes to higher uh, velocity training, these pination angles will change uh, kind of to meet those demands. So again, important to consider um, how we're laying out our training programs for all of these both physiological and neurological adaptations. All right, so now that we understand the adaptations that take place from high velocity throwing sessions and the adaptations we need to create in order to improve throwing velocity, let's discuss what a velocity development session looks like and why they look the way they do, okay? So when we talk about exposure to high velocity stimuli, we know that we need it probably once or twice in every seven day period, roughly, um, according to the some of the research from Isserin and how long these kind of high velocity adaptations um, stay around. So there's a couple of important things to consider. One is, what does the output look like from that specific athlete and how well are they going to recover before the next session, right? That, that'll kind of give you an idea of how frequently you can do these things. In general, most guys are going to need two or three days bare minimum before they can do that very high velocity type of stuff again, okay? So you can kind of build it around that and kind of go um, with that pattern throughout, okay? The specifics of a session, why do they look the way they do? Well, they need to be, the, the, the goals need to be very simple, all right, and pretty directed when we're going after maximal output, okay? So for example, we're trying to maximize lower body output. We're probably not gonna use a single leg squat on a BOSU ball um, with the bar overhead, right? We're probably gonna use a very simple squat variation with both feet, 
all right? We're gonna maximize either load on the bar, velocity on the bar, or some mix of both. We're maximizing our power, all right, if we're going after maximal output there. The same is true with, with uh, high velocity throwing, okay? When we wanna maximize velocity, we're not worried about the specifics necessarily of throwing a strike of the pattern being uh, a pitch from the mound. We may need to do these other things. So when we're using a running throw, we're after super maximal velocity, right? That's important to remember. If we're using some kind of constraint drill, we're probably doing two things. One, we're simplifying the delivery to some degree, and we're going after maximal output as well as training the specific uh, mechanical component as well. We can do those things, all right? In the off season, it's okay to take a few steps back from being very specifically prepared to go after a specific adaptation on this one quality. So in this case, it's velocity, right? In order to do that, we may need to sacrifice our specific preparation for being able to, you know, be game ready, go in and get hitters out with like three nasty pitches dotted all around the plate, okay? We may need to take a step back from that. The reason command may not be a big concern at this point is because we don't want to distract from our one goal of throwing it as hard as possible if it's truly a velocity development session. Now, as we get closer to competition or important outing or whatever, we need to make sure we're more dialed in when it comes to being specifically prepared. So being ready to get hitters out, being able to throw strikes, and being able to throw multiple pitches for strikes and have them move the way we want. But when we're just talking about purely a velocity development session, those things are not super important right now, okay? And so the other piece to kind of remember here is appropriate rest, both between throws and between sessions, kind of like we talked about earlier. All right, so if you have questions about what a velocity development session looks like, refer back to this video or feel free to drop questions below uh, or shoot me an email as well. Um, otherwise, if I see a comment, I'll be referring people to here or my article on this topic. Thanks for watching.